everybody. Uh, in case this is your first Tumblosity session with us and you haven't seen my face before, my name is Natalie and I am the office manager for Tumble Home. I am also the moderator for all of these sessions. So uh, just before we get started, I have a few quick things to go over uh, and then we can get going. So bear with me. I'll try to be as quick as possible. Uh, you may have noted that uh, everybody's mic is muted. Unfortunately, we have a, a good amount of participants tonight. We do really love when you guys can participate and when we can engage with you. Uh, but we also want to make sure that we can get through the program and leave time for questions at the end. So if you guys do have questions at any time, you can type them out in the chat. You can either send them to me privately or you can uh, send them to everybody. Uh, and I'll be keeping track of these and I will make sure that they get asked at the end. On the subject of the chat, it will remain public so that you guys can engage with one another. Uh, we do ask that you do not spam the chat uh, or distract your fellow participants. Um, if one of our moderators does feel that behavior is disruptive or inappropriate in any way, we unfortunately will need to remove anybody involved. Um, and we really don't want to have to do that because this is an excellent program and we want everybody to enjoy it. So if you just keep your conversations relevant to what you're seeing on the screen, uh, that would be awesome and we'll all have a great time. Uh, we also have a few polls for you to keep an eye out for that will pop up throughout the session. Uh, all of your answers to those questions are anonymous, so you don't have to worry about answering wrong. Uh, we just really love to compare notes and see what you guys think. So please, please jump in on those. Uh, we also do record these sessions. So uh, we're currently broadcasting live on our YouTube page. And tomorrow uh, we will be sending an email out with a link to that YouTube page in case you want to rewatch the presentation or share it with your friends. Um, and lastly, you can see a discount code on the screen right now that will get you 25% off our presenter's books. And I will make sure to post that in the chat so that everybody can copy and paste if you like. But if for some reason you do miss that information, once again, it will be emailed to you. We'll make sure that you get everything that you need. So on that note, now that business has been concluded, I would really like to introduce you guys to our absolutely remarkable presenter. We are totally thrilled to be joined today by Dr. Eva Pell, who is the author of Tumble Homes Rescue Series. Uh, those, those books focus on the rescue of endangered species, which you might have guessed based on the topic of this Zoom. Um, Eva has a BS in biology and a PhD in plant biology and was internationally known for her research studying the impact of air pollutants on vegetation. She also was elected a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and was the undersecretary for science at the Smithsonian Institution, where in 2014 she was awarded the Joseph Henry Medal. Uh, Dr. Pell is currently a member of the Board of Discovery Space and State College, Pennsylvania, and is a member of the Society for Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. I know that we have an absolutely amazing program in store for you guys, so I'm going to stop talking and turn this over to Eva, and I hope you all enjoy. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, I am so excited to be with you guys and to share with you some information about endangered species, see what you know, and tell you a little bit about my book. So we're going to get right to it. And we have to go up to the top here. All right, so I have a question right from the beginning, and I can't see all of you, so I'm gonna have to guess at your answer, but how many of you have ever seen an endangered species? You have? Well, that's pretty cool. You, if you've seen an endangered species, I bet it was in a museum, like this little fella here, these dinosaurs, because we can't, you may, oh, did I say who's seen an endangered species? I don't even ask the right question. Have you ever seen an extinct species is what I wanted to know. I think all those hands have gone, just gone down because how could you have seen an extinct species? They're extinct. Sometimes when I ask that question, kids do say that they've seen an extinct species, and that's because they've seen dinosaur bones in a museum. Well, if something's extinct today, it means it hasn't always been extinct. And I need to just, uh, I haven't messed anything up now. I just had something coming across my screen. Hopefully, you can still admit people. Yes? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yes. I don't know how many of you have ever been to Washington, D.C., 
and maybe gone to the National Zoo. But if you did, you would have seen this poster. And it's got seven letter levels of extinction from least concerned, near threatened, vulnerable, endangered, critically endangered, extinct in the wild. What is that? And extinct. Those are the seven levels that scientists all over the world use when they're trying to figure out what's endangered. Now I thought, <laughs> my precious disappeared on me. I want to play a game with you. I'm going to give you all some clues, then I'm going to show you four animals, and then I'm going to ask you to take a guess as to who I am. And we're going to do a bunch of these. When Europeans first discovered North America, there were three to five billion of us. We lived from central Ontario, Quebec, and Nova Scotia, south to the uplands of Texas, Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. I could fly 60 miles an hour. When born, I was naked and blind, but in two weeks, I was big and could leave the nest. I was so happy living in the trees. But then the farmers moved in and started destroying the forests. Not my fault we needed to go into the farms to find food. People started throwing nets over, the nets over the clouds of us, all my friends and family killing us by the thousands. The last one of us alive was Martha, and she died in the Cincinnati Zoo in 1914. I am officially extinct. Am I a passenger pigeon? Am I a great auk or a Labrador duck? Or am I a dodo? Oh, it gave you the answer. Darn. <laughs> All right, we're <laughs> going to go on to the next one. I am having a little problem with my fingers here in this, but the answer is passenger pigeon. We're going to, the next one, I promise you, I will not. I will not mess that up. These animals are all extinct, but a long time ago, before people lived in North America, all of our whole country was in forests. And these guys lived all over the place. Well, farmers, they started chopping down the forests, and these animals did not have any place to go. So they clustered in the trees that were left. And then the farms came along and they needed food and there were so many of them. So they went on to the farms and the farmers didn't want to have their farms destroyed. So these animals lost their habitat and they lost their food source. And then they were hunted into extinction. Now, if you ever want to see Martha, she was taken to the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History. She was stuffed. And the last time I was there, she was on a perch on the second floor. So someday, maybe you'll get a chance to see her. All right, let's try another one and see if I can make this work better. I live in the desert. Why is it giving the pole already? I live in the desert where... I may need some help here. I live in the desert where it's really hot and where water is limited. To help cope with the heat and drought of the desert, my body can go up to 116 degrees Fahrenheit without me feeling sick or sweaty. If your body goes up more than nine to 98.6, you're going to feel pretty sick. And I can tell you, you're not going to make it if, you have, if your body ever goes up to 116 degrees. A hundred years ago, there were hundreds of thousands of us in the Sahara and Sahel regions of North Africa, where the countries of Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, Libya, Egypt, Mauritania, Mali, Niger, Chad, and Sudan are today. 
we lived in herds of 20 to 40. Today, I only live in captivity, although some reintroductions are being tried. Because of the drought, loss of food and habitat and hunting, I am extinct in the wild. Who am I? Am I a lesser kudu? Am I a scimitar horned oryx? Am I, wait, not yet. Am I an elves deer? Or am I a cow? Now let's see if I can get the pole to work. You know what? I think, Natalie, you're going to have to do the poll because... I'm on it. Don't worry. We've got this. <laughs> We've got some uh, some answers come in and already. Uh, we're seeing 50, 55% are saying lesser kudu. 29% uh, is scimitar horned oryx. Nobody says cow. And 13% say elds deer. I'm going to give you guys two more seconds to get your answers in. And now okay. we can all see the results. Okay, so half of you think it's the lesser kudu. Well, let me show you what it is. Now I got to get rid of that. Oh. It's the scimitar horned oryx. So about 30% of you, it's not some... It's not surprising you don't know because it is extinct in the wild. Um, the lesser kudu is a near threatened animal that lives in Africa and the elds deer is an endangered animal that lives in Southeast Asia and India. But the scimitar horned oryx really got into trouble because there was so much drought and their habitat was being destroyed. And today they only live in captivity with some very rich people that have small herds, but places like the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute and some other places around the world have been working with people in their, in their range country. And they've identified a couple of countries like Chad in Africa where they think those animals might be able to survive. And they're starting to do something called reintroduction, which means take these animals from captivity and try to bring them back. So there may be a happy story here at some point. Let's try another one. I live in Africa. I think you guys are gonna get this one. Over the past 50 years, I've become extinct in at least 13 countries, including Tenya, Kenya, Tanzania, Namibia, and Botswana. My habitat includes grasslands, savannas, dense vegetation, and mountains. I'm the fastest land mammal. I can run 60 to 70 miles per hour in the wild. I live eight to 10 years. My sound can be like a bird chirping. I can purr and yelp. I am vulnerable. Am I a cheetah? Am I a bobcat? Am I a tiger? Or am I a lion? Got a All right, what do you guys think? So far, looking good. We've got the majority saying cheetah. A few people saying tiger and bobcat. Nobody thinks it's a lion yet. All right, I'm going to give you guys five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, and our final result. We've got over half saying cheetah. All right, let's see. Ta-da! You got that one just right. It's a cheetah. So cheetahs and lions both live in Africa, and they're both vulnerable. Tigers are critically endangered. They live in Southeast Asia, Russia, Sumatra, which I'll tell you more about later, uh, but they are in deep, deep trouble. And I have to say of all the cats, I think they, my personal, I think they're the most magnificent. And the bobcat is the one that's of least concern. And the bobcat lives right here in North America. All right, let's try another one. I live throughout North America. I became the national symbol of the United States in 1872, and there were 100,000 birds like me. In 1963, 
thanks to a pesticide called DDT, there were only 483 nesting pairs left. I was in danger of extinction. But DDT was banned. And today, there are 10,000 nesting pairs of birds like me. I can live up to 50 years. I am of least concern. Am I a barred owl or a kiwi or a bald eagle or a pelican? What do you guys think? All right, we've got the poll up. So far, everyone says bald eagle. I can see it. <laughs> going to give you guys five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, and one. Okay, 85 of you said, percent of you said bald eagle, and right you are. The bald eagle and the barred owl and the pelican are all of least concern, and they are all in the live all in the Americas. The barred owl and the bald eagle live in North America and the pelican lives in both North and South America. The kiwi is actually vulnerable and the kiwi, if you didn't know, lives in New Zealand. Now, I think the bald eagle story is maybe one of the most hopeful stories about endangerment that I know. When I was a young girl, DDT was a huge problem. It was one of the early pesticides that was being used, and people thought it was really going to help because it was killing mosquitoes, which carry terrible diseases. Unfortunately, DDT is a certain type of pesticide, and it does not break down, so it just kept getting more and more of it was building up in the environment. And it was moving through the food chain, so it was passing into fish, and that's what bald eagles eat. And people started to notice that the eggshells on the bald eagles were getting very thin. And if an eggshell is too thin, what's going to happen to that little chick? It's going to hatch too soon and it's going to die. And by the late 1960s, well, the bald eagle was looking like it was going down. And then people wisely made decisions, not only in the United States, but in most places in the world. They banned the use of this pesticide. And with time, the bald eagles come back. I always ask groups, how many of you have seen bald eagles? And so many people raise their hands. Well, let me tell you, 50 years ago, none of us would be raising our hands. So we can solve these problems. We can solve them if we understand what causes endangerment and we do something about it. All right, let's move on here and see what else we've got. There's your bald eagle. Who am I? I am a great ape, but I don't live in Africa. I live in Borneo and Sumatra, islands in Asia. I love fruit, and I eat 300 different types. My mother and I stay together until I'm around eight years old, so she can teach me everything I need to know. We live in nests in the tree, and we make a new one every night. We live in the rainforest, but a lot of it's being cut down for all palm oil plantations. My mother watches out for me because human hunters want to capture little ones like me to sell for pets. I'm critically endangered. Who am I? Am I a lowland gorilla? Am I a... This thing pops up here. Am I a white cheek gibbon? Am I a black howler monkey or am I an orangutan? Oh, <laughs> I did it again. I gave you guys your answer. <laughs> okay. Everybody's saying orangutan on the, on the, the, okay. now, so I think, <laughs> yeah, I think you would have said orangutan if my little finger here wasn't so jumpy. So let me just tell you a little bit about these friends. The lowland gorilla that lives in Africa, the white cheek gibbon that lives in China and Vietnam, and our friend here, the orangutan, who lives in Indo two islands in Indonesia, only two islands, Borneo and Sumatra. All three of them are critically endangered. 
only the black howler monkey is of least concern. The black howler monkey lives in the Americas, um, in Central America and South America. If you ever encounter a black howler monkey, you will never forget it because they are so loud. One time I was sleeping in a cabin in Panama on a, in, a, in a wildlife reserve. And at night in those kinds of places, you, you don't have any power. So it's dark and you're sleeping in a net. And you're listening to the sounds of the forest and all of a sudden the black howler monkey decides to speak. And oh my gosh, you would think you had the biggest animal ever standing in front of your cabin. They have a voice much bigger than their body. So they're pretty cool, but we don't have to worry so much about them. But the orangutan, our darling orangutan has lots of problems. And now I want to tell you about my 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 series and about the first book I wrote. So my series is called Rescue, and it's about rescuing endangered species. And the first book is called Rescue and the Baby Orangutan. So before I tell you um, about the specific book, I want to introduce you to my characters. So Rescue is the name of a foundation that was established by this woman. Her name is Ariella Gordon. And the foundation's goal is to rescue endangered species. Ariella is a wildlife photographer, and she and her father used to love talking about all of her work. He owned a bunch of pizza stores, and when he knew his life was about at its end, he told her, I know you don't want to get into the pizza business, so I'm going to leave you my money. You sell the pizza businesses, and you start a foundation to rescue endangered species. And that's what Ariella did. Well, she couldn't run this foundation by herself, so she enlisted two very special people. One is this young man. He's 11 years old. He's her grandson. His name is Wheaton Ivan Ginto. Now, his initials are W for Wheaton, I for Ivan, and G for Ginton, Ginto, and that spells wig. That's his nickname. You can probably guess why. He's got quite the hair <laughs> piece on top of his head. Well, he's a pretty special little guy. He is a brainiac, as his cousin calls him. He is 11 years old. He's already been to college. He has a degree in material science and engineering. He's doing some secret work for the military. And Ariella thought, who would be better to design all the vehicles and gizmos they were going to need if they were going to be traveling uh, all over the world to try and rescue endangered species? And to round out the team, she enlisted her granddaughter, Wheaton's cousin, Stowe. Stowe LeBlond is 12. She's a year older than Wheaton. I should tell you, Wheaton lives in New Jersey. Stowe lives in Vermont. If Wheaton is a city slicker, a little bit of a scaredy cat and a brainiac, Stowe is a completely different animal. She lives in the wilds of Vermont. She's homeschooled because they live on the side of a mountain. She's a competitive skier. She loves everything about the national, natural world. And she's not afraid of anything. And sometimes she even leaps before she looks, which is what's happened here. She's gone to take a picture of this very interesting picture. Of them. And she hasn't paid attention as she stepped out onto a bog. And now Wheaton's pulling her out. So this is the team of the rescue team that goes on the adventures. So here's the story that uh, Rescue the Baby Orangutan is framed around. One day, Wheaton and Stowe happen to be together, and, a, and Ariel is off someplace, and a ranger calls from a national park in Borneo, which is a very large island, uh, in the, uh, in the, which is part of the country of Indonesia, and he's very concerned. They're responsible for the orangutans. The orangutans only live, as I told you, in two places in the world, Borneo and Sumatra, and they're critically endangered. And 
what's happened is this this mother orangutan has been shot in the hand and they like to be up in the trees well she can't get into the tree because her hand's been shot and not only is that a problem because who would shoot her but they know that she has a baby named buddy and buddy is missing and one of the things that poachers do is they tend to shoot the mothers so they can snatch the babies so they're very concerned that this baby that has been taken by poachers and they've got a very short window in which to find the baby before the poachers might send the baby off out of the country so they persuade ariella that they should go and off they go to indonesia to try and find baby bella Okay, so here's just a little map that's in the book. And this shows you the island of Borneo. It's very, very big. There are only a couple of islands in the world that are bigger. And there are a bunch of national parks. And this story takes place in uh, the, part of, uh, um, the part of Indonesia called West Kalimantan. And it's, the park is called Gunan Palang National Park. So in order to get there, they don't have much time. They don't have time to get on a commercial airplane and they have too much stuff to take with them. Luckily, Wheaton has invented a mini space shuttle. And if you have a pencil, write down the name. It's E-C-A-P-S. And maybe later during question and answer, you might want to tell me why what that name is and see if you can figure out the clue. Anyway, they get in the ECAPS and the ECAPS is very cool because it's run with all this, this special fuels that don't mess up the environment. And within 90 minutes, they go from, Hope, from central New Jersey all the way around the world to Borneo. Now, once they get there, they can't obviously get around the country in a space shuttle. Fortunately, Wheaton has also invented the Helleboji. And the Helleboji, Stowe calls it the Swiss army knife of all, ter of all terrain vehicles because it can convert from a helicopter, heli, to a boat, to a jeep. And Borneo is this huge place, but people only live on the coasts. And there's very, to get inland, you can only get there either by helicopter or boat. So they're going to need this vehicle to do their rescuing. They make their way to the national park and they meet up with the forest ranger who lays out the whole problem for them. And along comes his teenage son, Rafi. And You'll have to read the book to find out how this all happens. But Rafi and Wheaton and Stowe go off together while the forest ranger and Ariella go in a different direction so that they can span out and look for Buddy, the baby orangutan that's missing. And you can imagine a lot happens. And I can't tell you whether they find the baby or not. What I'd like to do now, though, is read you a very short excerpt to give you a flavor for what the story is all about. And I'm going to read you from the beginning of a chapter called A Sun Bear in Trouble. The three of us look up at what appears to be a black bear tearing through the palm oil plantation. In the distance, voices are yelling and they don't sound friendly. Ariella, what's going on? Stowe whispers. Ariella's face is as white as her hair. The voices are getting closer. Exactly what I was worried about. Those may be poachers after that bear. They won't want any witnesses. What do we do now? Stowe's voice gets a little higher pitched. How long would it take to get us into the heli mode so we can get out of here? Too long, I tell Stowe. Besides, we need to witness this so we can report it. Don't worry. Here's what we're going to do. You two duck down in the middle of the boat. I crouch down and enter a command on the Heliboji's computer keyboard. 
My Wheaton-designed wrapping extends around both sides of the boat, forming a shield around the vehicle. I hope the swishing noise it makes as it extends doesn't attract attention. The wrapping is thin and light, like sandwich wrap. It's stronger than leather. How's this going to protect us? Stowe whispers. The covering's see-through. It's a light deflecting skin made of a meta material. Light bends around this material, making us invisible. Ariella puts her fingers to her lips. Three guys come into the clearing not far from the bear. One of them has a gun. Our grandmother has the lens of her camera sticking out of a tiny space in the invisible covering. I sure hope those guys don't notice. We hear a sharp pop, and the bear lets out a horrible wail. Stowe and I are holding hands so tight that we may be stopping each other's blood. After the bear keels over, the poachers wait a couple of minutes and then walk over to it. They're squatting down, looking at it from all angles. So weird. They almost look like they care. But then the guys pull the bear onto a stretcher and drag it off into the woods. Well, if you want to find out what happened to this poor little sun bear, you're going to have to read the book. I should tell you, this was as they were making their way to the forest station. So they haven't even met up yet with the ranger or with Rafi. So you can see a lot is happening even before they start looking for Buddy. And now it's your turn to ask me some questions if you have some. I can't hear you. <laughs> no. No. How about now? Wonderful. Yes. Perfect. My, I don't know why my mic does that. Anyway, uh, so I do have a few questions. <laughs> uh, we would love for you guys to keep typing more questions in the chat. Uh, but the first one I would like to ask is, do you know how many endangered species are native to the United States? Off the top of your head. I do not know that question, but I will tell you that there is a wonderful place you can go online called The Red List. And if you go on, if you just type in Red List, it will take you to this fantastic website and you can ask any question you want. Uh, you could type in an animal that you're interested in or you can type in a geographic region and you can start to get those answers. Okay, that's really cool and helpful. Thank you. Um, also, uh, it, you might not know this one, but uh, is the sloth bear endangered? That's something we could find on Red List. Yeah. Um, I, th I am pretty sure the answer is yes, but um, we could go and look right now or you can go when we get done. Perfect. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. Where have you traveled to see endangered species? Um, well, I have um, outside the country, I have been to Panama many times. The Smithsonian has a tropical research institute there. And um, I've had the opportunity to see many endangered species. I've been to Kenya. Um, I have been to Alaska. I have been to Antarctica. And uh, you see very different animals in, in those places. Um, those, those are... Those are the places that are jumping up at me. Well, I've been to, I've seen the puffins in Iceland. And so that gives you a little flavor for it. That's, that's amazing. That It's also amazing how many different animals you can see from different places around the world. Mm -hmm. um, I want to, I want to tag along on these adventures. <laughs> that's what the books are for. Um, do you write about species you have seen in person uh, I'm very interested in protecting pangolins, though I have not met one in person yet. Well, I am very interested in pangolins also. I will tell you a little bit more about why in a minute. Um, 
I have written about, uh, let me think, um, certainly I have seen uh, all the species that I have written about so far, I have seen, but mostly I have seen them in zoos. And that probably, um, I have not been to Indonesia, uh, even though I know many people who have, and they have helped me to visualize uh, Indonesia. In fact, wh when I was writing the book, I ended up being put in touch with somebody and he said, oh, call me up. And we ended up on the phone and I said, I'm trying to imagine where this beach is that I write about this one beach in the story. And he goes, well, I'm standing on that beach right now. So, oh, so yeah, but um, zoos are very important. I think before I worked for the Smithsonian, I thought that zoos are just an awful place where animals are held in captivity for people to gawk at them. But good zoos, as the zoo director at the Smithsonian used to say, will put themselves out of business because their main job is to help with conservation. And the animals that, that, are, that are in captivity, the endangered species, were either born in captivity or had to be rescued. Nobody is going into the wild anymore. No, at least no credible zoo will ever go into the wild to capture an animal. So um, the, the, my third book, which is not out yet, is about frogs, and I have definitely seen them in the wild. Oh, yes. Awesome. <laughs> but I will say, you know, when they're endangered, they're hard to see that, that, for that very reason. That's a very good point. Um, kind of swinging in, a, in the opposite direction of endangered, have you discovered any animals? Uh, no. <laughs> I am actually a plant scientist, and I... Um, I actually worked in my in my research area. I worked on um, I worked on agricultural species. I didn't work on wild species. So it was only when I started working at the Smithsonian that I that I came to I came to learn of this. But many people at the Smithsonian are discovering. Um, are discovering new organisms all the time. And I think that's one of the things that makes us so worry so much about biodiversity in the future, because animals are going extinct almost every day. Some of them will never, ever have been discovered. That's kind of mind blowing, if you think about it. <laughs> um, one comment, Lincoln would like to say that he liked the part of the story and wants to read the rest. So that's awesome. I highly encourage it. It's a great book. Phenomenal. Um, how many endangered species have you seen? Uh, um, that would take, I, I would have to sit down and think about that for quite a while. Um, when I was in Africa alone, we saw so many, we, you know, because when that's one thing, if you go to Africa, we, the Smithsonian had field station there and, uh, we spent quite a bit of time there and you see everything you see, you see zebras and you see lions and you see, um, giraffes and wild dogs and all kinds of things. So I, I don't think I could give you a number, not this yes. I, I understand that. And that's actually really awesome that, that you don't have a, a solid number. That means you've seen so many. So I think that's super cool. Um, we are getting a little close on time. So I'm going to ask you just a couple more questions. Um, first is what age level are most of your books geared towards? And also, can you tell us a little bit about your other book? Sure. Well, I think the books are great for... Um, nine to 12 year olds can read them on their own. Um, I know personally a few kids that are somewhat younger but love animals and have had them read to them by their parents. One thing I didn't say when I was talking about the books is that I mentioned that Stowe is homeschooled. And because she's homeschooled, the only way she's allowed to go on the adventures is if she writes logs. So if you read the book, the stories, the chapters, that's all fiction. But the logs, that's where you can find the, some of the facts you guys seem to be interested in. So there'll be facts about the animals, facts about the, lo the geography, the locations, and facts about some of Wheaton's gizmos because the materials he uses are real, even though at this point, some of the applications are a little bit out there. Now, in order to be able to tell you about the next book that will be that has come out, um, I need to go back to my presentation. And before I leave this slide, let me say for those of you that might leave here and hopefully will get the books, if you have questions 
questions. I love to communicate with readers. You can just go to my website, which is very simple, evapel.com. I have a very easy to spell name and there's a contact box and you can, I sometimes get wonderful notes from kids asking me all kinds of questions. So please do so. All right. So I want to play one more Who Am I game to tell you about my other book. I once lived in Europe and Asia. In the late 1800s, a lot of us were hunted down and put in zoos. There were some terrible winters which killed a bunch of us, and we had to compete with goats and sheep for food. By the end of the 1960s, we were extinct in the wild. Wildlife scientists started breeding those of us in zoos, and around 2000, started reintroducing us into the wild. Today, there are 500 of us living in the wild in three countries, Mongolia, China, and Kazakhstan. Today, I'm just endangered. Am I a grevy zebra? Am I a wallaby? Am I an American bison? Or am I a Chowalski horse? That Chowalski is a Polish name, and the Mongolian name is Taki. Uh, I'm glad you pronounced that because I would not have been able to. <laughs> I know. Spelling is even harder, let me tell you. I believe it. Uh, all right, I'm going to give everybody about five more seconds. We've got the majority saying the Taki. I'm not going to try to pronounce it. <laughs> um, we have a few saying American bison, uh, some saying wallaby, and one saying grevy zebra. And I'm going to stop the polling. All right. Okay, okay. so about half of you think it's the Chowalski horse. So let's find out. There it is. It's the Taki, the Chowalski horse. The grebe zebra is also endangered, as is the taki. The wallaby, which lives in um, Australia, is of least concern. And the bison is near threatened. So the bison has got its troubles, but nothing like the taki. So the book I wrote is called Rescue Takes on the Taki. And if you read the orangutan book, you might get hot and sweaty while you're reading it. And you're in the rainforest in Borneo near the equator. Well, if you read talkie, you're going to want to be putting on your heaviest sweatshirt. The story takes place in Mongolia, and I feel like this is one of those victories for endangered species, because as I said, they were extinct in the wild. There were no wild taki left in the 1960s. And then people really started rolling up their sleeves, including at the Smithsonian. When I was there, they had a baby born and a cult and a fall, I should say, and they started reintroducing them. And so the story is about how our team, the rescue team, is called by um, some of the conservation biologists in Mongolia because it seems that every year scientists go out to check and see how are these reintroduced horses doing. They live in these little families, one stallion, a bunch of mare, and a couple of foals. And these scientists have been doing a survey, and one of the families is missing, the entire family. Well, Mongolia is nothing like the rainforest. It's hard to find things in the rainforest. In Mongolia, it's just like it looks here. It's wide open spaces. You're not going to lose 10 of these horses. And if they were all killed or if they all died of a disease, you'd see a pile of bones somewhere. So the worry is that they've run away from the national park where they have been uh, reintroduced and there are mines and there are, there are places they could get in trouble. Some scientists have been going out and doing the survey and somehow they've gone missing too. The feeling is that their batteries are just dead on their, G on their phones or something. So rescue goes and they go and they meet up with um, uh, some no a nomadic tribe. A lot of Mongolians are still nomads. And they befriend a young girl about 17 years old. And just like in the other story, the adults have to deal with some pretty serious problems. And the kids go off to look for the horse. And it's a pretty exciting rescue. They, they come across a lot of things they hadn't anticipated. And there are wolves to contend with and terrible weather. 
it's um, it's a challenge. So uh, if you want to read two books about two endangered species, one which is in great dire dire trouble, the orangutan, and one where science has made a difference and there is hope um one that's hot and one that's cold uh i think you'll find them both a lot of fun and um i look forward to hearing from some of you someday so thank you so much it was just delightful to be with all of you thank you for joining us eva i was that's absolutely wonderful uh, and very informative I can't stress how much I love these books. So I hope everybody takes advantage of this wonderful discount code. Um, thank you again for joining us. I know we're right at the 545 mark. So uh, I appreciate everybody who stuck with us and uh, hope to see you next time. Thank you. Bye.